Apple, Microsoft, Netflix, Tesla, Uber, and a bunch of other companies have recently fallen victim to an interesting new supply chain exploit discovered by a security researcher named Alex Beerson. Let's talk about how. On a high level, this new exploit, called a dependency confusion attack, allows an attacker to take control and execute arbitrary code on a system by abusing the way that package managers treat private dependencies. But what does that really mean? In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of how this exploit works, a blueprint for how it could be implemented, and examples for how you can protect your projects from falling victim to it. But before we get into that, be sure to subscribe to me so you don't miss any of my future computer science, technology, or math videos. To understand what this attack does, let's start with a high-level overview and then drill down to the specifics. In Beerson's Medium write-up, which I'll leave a link to down in the description, he gives a basic overview of the steps he took to carry out this exploit. Pretty much what would happen is an attacker would find a piece of code from the company that they're trying to attack. This could either be something that they open sourced as a separate module, or it could be something like just JavaScript information that was left behind by Webpack after a project was built. From there, he'd be able to find the names of some private dependencies that the company depends on for their projects, but which are not available to the general public. Once he has the names of these private dependencies, he can create modules with the exact same name on public registries, for example, npm if it's a node project, or on pypi if it's a Python project, and then just give them a higher version number than the private dependencies that the company is using. Once these are uploaded, the next time that that project gets built, NPM or PIP or whatever tool they're using will recognize the version that was published by the attacker as the most up-to-date and newest version of the module. It will then download it, and once it is downloaded, the module will be able to use something like pre-install hooks to run arbitrary code on the system it's been downloaded to. It can use this to phone home or open a backdoor or really do anything on the system that the attacker wants it to. Now let's get a bit more into the specifics of why an exploit like this actually works. The first thing that's going to be important to understand is how dependency-based development and the package managers that make it possible actually function. At this point in time, pretty much no company or project has complete vertical control of all of the code that makes up their projects. Just take a look at any Node.js project and you'll see a Node modules folder full of gigabytes of libraries, which the developers probably don't even know what they do. So because of this, when developers are writing a project, they are putting a ton of trust not only into the modules that they use, but also to the package managers that are controlling those modules. This is normally not an issue because most developers stick to widely used and accepted libraries, and most of these libraries are either run by huge open source communities or are controlled by managers who are trustworthy. But these are not the projects that we have issues with. The issue comes up when we start to talk about proprietary systems that are being written by private companies. The benefit of package management systems like NPM, PyPI, or RubyGems is the portability that they give code and their version management capability. This is great for open source projects, but companies also want to be able to use these tools for their own private modules and dependencies. In these cases, companies will often take advantage of another feature of these package management tools, namely private dependencies. These dependencies will act just like other public dependencies, but are hosted somewhere else and are not accessible to people who are not explicitly granted permission to use them. This all sounds well and good, but we run into an issue with how these package management systems actually pick which dependencies to download. A common pattern for what they will do is find whatever dependencies on both public registries and whatever private registries a user has access to match both the name and version constraints of the package that they're trying to find. Once it does this, it will often just pick whichever package has the newest version number because it assumes that that is the most up-to-date. This is where the problem occurs. Let's say that your company has a dependency called mycompany-dep1, and it's on version 1.23.4. Normally, your dependency manager, when you're building a project, would simply look through the public registry, determine that there are no modules with the same name as the one that you're looking for, and then look through your private registry and download the correct thing. But if an attacker uploads a module with the exact same name, and then puts a version number that's higher, for example, version 99.99.99, .99, then NPM or PIP or whatever you're using will use the attacker's module instead. Now that the module has successfully made it onto your computer, it can begin its actual attack. Since many dependencies that are being downloaded by package managers rely on other tools being on your system to function, most package managers provide some sort of pre-install hook, which the 
module can call in order to run arbitrary code on your computer before installing themselves as a module. For example, the PyTesseract project, which is a Python wrapper for the optical character recognition engine called Tesseract, needs to actually install Tesseract enabled to function, so it will call some code on your computer to actually do that before installing itself as a Python module. This is fine in most cases, but in the case of a dependency confusion attack like we're talking about here, the pre-install hook can do pretty much anything it wants. It can phone home to the attacker system with files or information from the computer it got in installed on, or it could do something more malicious like open up a backdoor and start some sort of network attack. So that covers how the attack actually works, but we still haven't discussed how you would actually find the names of these private dependencies. Beerson goes into some of how he did this in his write-up. So the first, most basic strategy you could use would just be to look through GitHub or some other public version control software for code that this company has made public that may include references to their private dependencies. But most of the time, this is not going to work because there's no reason why a company would publish code that has references to its private dependencies because they wouldn't be open sourcing it if it relied on proprietary code. But what actually gave Alex a lot more success was to just hit web endpoints within this company's file structure and then get the JavaScript files back from that. And then from there, just determine what dependencies it depends on by reading those JavaScript files. This worked most of the time because Webpack would for some reason just leave the package.json file verbatim inside of the JavaScript files that it was building, but could also occur in other reasons like just being included inside of require statements or something like that. So since Beerson is only a researcher, he only had his malicious packages phone home with enough information to prove that his exploit actually works, but if an attacker used this exact same structure, he could easily gain control of systems in any vulnerable company. So that's the core of the dependency confusion attack. Now let's take a second to talk about some mitigation strategies. The mitigation strategies that you're going to use are going to vary slightly based on what technologies you're using, but as a broad overview, the most important thing to do is to ensure that your private dependencies are always going to be installed from your actual private registry instead of just checking for any module with that name. The best way to do this is to use the tools that are provided to you by the package managers that you're using. For example, when you're installing things with pip, you can use the dash i flag to specify what repository you actually want to download from. And when you're using npm, you can define the versions that you want to use for your dependencies with a direct git or github link instead of just using a version number. By doing this, you will ensure that you're only going to be downloading the actual code that you want to be running instead of just whatever it finds with the correct name. There are also other practical mitigation strategies that you should be using regardless. Uh, for example, using a testing framework to ensure that all of the code that you download functions as intended, although in this case that would already be too late if they put something on the pre-install hook, and also making sure that all of the code that you download has the correct hash with what you expect it to be. That is going to be all for me for today. I hope you enjoyed this video and it gave you a better understanding of this new and very interesting supply chain attack. As I mentioned before, I left a link to the original write-up down in the description. And while you're down there, be sure to subscribe to me so you don't miss any of my future technology, computer science, or math videos. If there are any topics that you want me to explain, be sure to leave a comment down below with any requests, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.